All right. So we will um, go ahead and get started. It's just one minute after 12 o'clock, but I want to make sure that we don't wait too long since there's a lot to go over today. And it looks like we have Kentucky, Georgia, Idaho, Missouri on the line. And Jada, I apologize. Are you from Mississippi? You can type into the chat box if I'm wrong, but I'm going to go with Mississippi. Um, so yes, I'm good. from Mississippi. Oh, perfect. There we go. All right, good. Um, yeah, and I just got some really exciting news. I think actually the Mississippi Hospital Association is forming an ACO with a bunch of their rural. So um, interesting developments in your state for sure. Um, so today we're going to be talking about how you as a FLEX program can support success and sustainability of value-based pay. Um, the idea for this webinar is that you start to generate some ideas of how you can leverage your flex funding to support value-based pay. We'll spend a little bit of time going over the assessment results, because um, I'm very curious to hear what your impressions were. I know um, some states had more responses than others, and that, kind of afford, uh, that of course, can affect um, you know, what you're seeing in the data. But I think it's always interesting to hear, you know, how it compares with what you're hearing on the ground. And then I want to go through um, some of the areas of the FLEX program. I know everybody just put in their, um, um, their new proposal for the next cycle of FLEX funding. So um, we might be a day late on this one, but I think there's a lot, of, um, a lot of room to look at, even if you've named specific activities that you're already doing for FLEX funding, to consider, you know, before you get those vendors to the contracting or before you plan those trainings, some ways that you can kind of tailor them to support value-based pay. So the idea is we'll talk through some interventions in generality. Um, I'd love for this to be really interactive. We've had some good flex programs. I think Michigan has really been a leader in this um, in kind of acting as a convener for value-based pay among the rural hospitals in their state. But I'm curious to hear what everybody else is doing. So we'll talk about a couple different areas where I think you'll be able to leverage flex funding to provide technical assistance if you're seeing a need there. Um, and then we'll talk about some other resources that are available as well. And then after this webinar, between now and the next time, um, the go-to activity will be completing a state-specific resource guide for supporting value-based pay. So with that, um, is there anything else that anybody was dying to talk about today? No? All right. Well, we'll go ahead and um, just do a round robin to recap on the results that you saw from your survey. And maybe you didn't have time to fill out that document, that's totally fine. We really want this learning collaborative to be a resource for you all. So hopefully you had a chance to at least look at the, um, the tables that I sent out that had everybody's results for each state kind of collated and get some impressions of um, and get some impressions of what was going on in your state. I know it sounds like it was uh, one of our Western meetings took place last week, so I know a lot of people were out of office, but let's just go around. Um, we can follow the participant list, and if you just want to share one thing that either surprised, concerned you, impressed you about the results from your state survey if you've had a chance to look, um, I think it'd just be interesting to hear where everybody's at with those survey results. And if you hated the survey and found it useless, definitely give us that feedback, too, um, because I think uh, Caleb's always looking for some ways, and me as well, looking for some ways to improve this. So we'll go ahead, and I just want to hear from everybody, you know, from your sur survey results, uh, what surprised you, impressed you, concerned you, et cetera. Um, so we'll go ahead and um, go with the round robin order here. So let's go ahead and start with, oh, shoot, we don't have a first name on the um, D. Waldrop. If you want to go ahead and share first if you had the survey results, what surprised you about that? Oh, dear. Okay. I think um, we'll skip to Jada because I think um, there's some problems with reception. It's star two to unmute yourself. All right, Jada, did you have a chance to review any of the results from Mississippi? Well, I did not look at them in depth, but just from the review that I did get a chance to look at, I was not necessarily surprised, but excited to see the number of people that were actually engaged and wanting to actually, uh, for, you know, to actually form the ACO. And I know you mentioned earlier that you know the hospital association is working with them, so you know that's probably related to that. 
So I'm just excited that they are actually w willing and wanting to participate because before we've had a lot of resistance and a lot of people weren't interested. But I think you know people are just beginning to realize the value and with the changes coming, they're just wanting to go ahead and get on board now. So not a surprise, but I was excited to see that. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think um, from what I saw, because a bunch of the Mississippis, they're coming into the TCPI program now. But yeah, I think you've right. about maybe 24 hospitals that are thinking about it really seriously. So I think that's really exciting too, especially when we shift to talking about what you can do for technical assistance. You've got 24 folks that are interested. So very exciting things in Mississippi. All right, Kayla, how about Kentucky? Sure. So no big surprises in Kentucky. And you know, we only had 14 hospitals respond out of our 27, so I sort of, you know, took these results with a, a grain of salt, but a lot are, you know, have a strategy that they're working towards, but seems like maybe it's sort of on, on the back burner, and then most of them didn't report MIP, you know, so that was a little disappointing, and um, of the few that did report, only one actually reported their score, so, you know, I was anxious to see. I wish I could have seen some more of those MIT scores for the ones that did report. I would have really liked to have seen that, but we only had one report what their actual score was, so, you know, that was sort of interesting, and then I learned a lot about those scores on the uh, webinar last time, which I had to listen to the recording, but I enjoyed that overview. So, you know, no, no huge surprises. Wish we could have had more of the hospitals report. I would like to do this again. Um, and give everybody a little bit more time and send a reminder or two. Uh, that's usually what it takes in Kentucky to get everyone to, to fill out that's something fair. like that. But, but work with what I've got and, um, you know, and learn, learn quite a bit. So it was um, yeah, it's a learning experience. Oh, good. That's great. And I like your point about maybe revisiting this with the hospitals. Um, later, just because I think this time, like you said, it usually takes a while to get people, um, you know, engaged in a place where they'll respond, like you were saying. And I think if you have, you know, the starting to, the starting data to say, hey, you know, in our small sample, this many people didn't report. Yikes! You know, what do we need to do to help you? It's a good, um, good way to start the discussion. So that's good. All right, um, Laima, I know you just joined, but we are going around. If you had a chance to look at your um, at your state survey results, anything that surprised, concerned you, you found interesting, um, anything that you wanted to share from Nevada? All right, we'll go to Lisa and Georgia. Again, it's star two to um, unmute yourself. I think we're having a little bit of audio travel, or, uh, audio trouble, but um, Lisa, what about the Georgia results? Was there anything in there that you wanted to comment on? Uh, hi, Mike. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm, I'm sort of like Kayla. Um, we only had nine out of our 30 respond, so that was surprising to me because I was hoping to get better, you know, turnout as far as the survey was, um, but um, we have a unique situation. So, again, I looked at that and saw the majority of them, of course, wrote that they did not uh, participate. But we're also one of the uncontrollable disaster states, so they were told they didn't have to and not get a negative consequence. So I don't know what's draw, drawing, you know, driving their non-participation, whether it's, you know, the thing is, hey, I got a pass, so I don't have to, so I'm not. Or was it truly that they really didn't even know that and they just didn't do it? Um, and again, we had the one that gave the score, um, which kind of, you know, was a little surprising on how low that was. Um, but we're trying to work with the QIN. Um, GMCF Alliance is the uh, contractor for small rural QPP follow-up. So we're working with them to try to understand how many really did or how many didn't when that data comes to us. Um, mm -hmm. And then also, um, we have uh, not under our flex, but we have it under we have a patient-centered medical home grant. So I'm excited to learn more about these initiatives and see how I can link those two together, since that's an important part of um, of uh, the program. Mm -hmm. 
great. So it sounds like you've got kind of a couple different avenues to try there. And that's interesting. I didn't realize that Georgia um, was one of those states that had the disaster exception. But yeah, I think lots to dig into there. So thank you for sharing. All right, what about Idaho? Is it Mary and Stephanie or just Mary on the line today? I, uh, yeah, it's both of us. This is Mary. Um, um, I would say two things, and that is, um, as with others, we did just have seven uh, critical access hospitals respond. Um, the one score we had was a 74. But I think um, where I saw a potential opportunity is their oh, level of um, knowledge about value-based payment options. The average was 2.7. Um, and I was a bit surprised at that, so I really saw potential opportunities for us there. Um, the other thing that I thought was really interesting was the average HCC score that we had calculated for the rural counties. Um, ours was a 0 0.8, and um, I really had just had no idea about its existence, actually, or what it was, so I thought that was interesting. Yeah, and I think for me the main thing was just looking at the CHS of plans on cost. Mm -hmm. We had um, more than than the others that had not even started yet, um, and then some that just had ways to measure but no plan to address it. So I think those are the opportunities that we didn't really know uh, that we might need to be focusing on. Great. Thanks, Mary and Stephanie. And yeah, I think um, that is really interesting about the Idaho results, just because you all have so many critical access hospitals who have made that leap into an ACO that um, they're like those pockets of need, like you said, where some folks feel like they don't have a start on cost. Um, and then your point about the HCCs is right on. I think that is so interesting. And we're going to spend um, hopefully um, more, at least 10 minutes, there's so much to cover today, talking about HCCs and what that is. Um, that stands for hierarchical condition categories. I know probably not everybody had a chance to read through that. But that is the way that CMS profiles the risk of patients in, um, in the Medicare program. And I think that's particularly crucial for rural and value-based pay because so much of the adjustments and the projections that value-based pay is based on are correlated to those HCCs and how healthy CMS thinks your population are. So in most cases, um, I thought that was a really interesting data set, you know, one, because I'm a complete healthcare nerd, but two, because I think in all of the studies where they've actually been able to look at clinical data, they find that, you know, rural does worse, at, worse in health disparities with mortality, things like that. But what those HCC scores are saying, and I'd be interested to see if anybody else had time to analyze those HCC scores. I know that was kind of a beast of a data file. Um, but, you know, as Mary highlighted, their average came out to 0.8. The kind of average for the country as a whole is 1. So if you're scoring 0.8, that means that, you know, your patients are actually looking pretty healthy comparatively. And that's the way rural presents in this data set, but we know that that's probably not true. So looking at coding and accurate population data, I think it's so crucial for rural to be able to be successful in value-based pay. So we'll definitely revisit that. Great. And I know, Melissa, you said you hadn't had a chance to look at the scores. Is there anything else that um, you just wanted to comment on with the survey or anything like that? Oh, I think Melissa is typing in, so we'll in and go on. All right. So um, just so I have a feel for it, by raising your hand um, up in the top bar, did everybody who wasn't here last week have a chance to watch the recording of last week's webinar or listen to the recording? And it's totally okay if you didn't have time. I know folks were on the road. I just want to be able to tailor the discussion to whether or not um, people were able to watch the recording. Okay. Yes, this is Lisa. I did. Okay, perfect. All right. So it looks like a couple folks had time to watch the recording. Maybe a couple didn't. So we'll keep that in mind as we go through the discussion. So thanks for reflecting on those results. I was really interested in the results, too. I think total we had about 120 hospitals respond out of all of the states that sent them out. So it was really interesting um, 
It was really interesting data to me as well, and hopefully um, you all can hang on to that data file and kind of compare yourself to other states, things like that. Reach out to states who seem to be doing well. Um, it, it's always interesting to see what the needs are. I know when I was a flex coordinator, you know, we focused on all of the categories in the grant, but it was more with an angle towards kind of how do we keep our hospitals in business and help them kind of prepare for the future, but so much less was known about um, value-based payment models. We couldn't really tailor to value-based pay, and I think that's an emerging area to look at in the flex grant. So I think it's always interesting to have, even if you only got a couple hospitals to respond, just to see kind of what the level of interest is and the level of preparation for value-based pay, and something to keep in mind as you go forward in that next cycle of flex funding. So. We're going to talk about how you can leverage your flex funding or other resources that you might have at the state office of rural health or the hospital association, wherever your flex program is based, um, maybe your university based, um, how you can leverage the resources that you have through the flex or other grants or other connections to be able to help your rurals out. Um, and I think there's a couple of different levels of technical assistance that are needed. I tried to bucket them into two categories. So on one hand, we have kind of the structural um, technical assistance that folks need um, to keep pace with value-based pay. Um, and I think this spans the, the range of value-based pay. You know, everything from do they know what they should do in under MIPS to are they forward-thinking enough to go into some kind of alternative payment model, which for critical access households at this point in time basically means an ACO. Um, and then you have that second bucket, which is kind of looking at the competencies that you need to do well in an ACO. And I think these are competencies that can align really well with the FLEX funding. Um, you know, I haven't had a chance to read the, um, the funding proposal for this past cycle and how specific they got, but I think there's some ways to tweak what you're doing to further support those hospitals that have more value-based pay needs. Um, so. What we're looking at um, is these two buckets. And as we go through, we'll talk about kind of what are some of the questions you should be asking structurally, and then what are some of the areas of assistance that you might want to be going on or implementing kind of competency-wise. So I'll ask you all throughout the discussion today to kind of chime in, bounce ideas off of each other. I know nobody knows about the funding that you just um, that you just turned in, but just starting to generate some ideas. I think it's, it's a long process to plan for how you're going to support value-based pay, so there are so many directions you can take this. Today's uh, conversation is meant to just start generating ideas, and this is always something that you can flesh out later. So we're going to start by talking about some of the more structural elements of technical assistance that your hospitals might be looking for. Um, and like I said, as we go through this, I want you to start thinking about according to what is in the FLEX funding, where can you weave some of this in? So there's a lot of alignment between quality improvement, financial and operational improvement, population health, of course, um, and then integration of innovative care models. So let's start by talking about structural technical assistance. And I think this is an area where you really have to look at, you know, you've got to walk before you can run. So most critical access hospitals are or should be concerned about MIPS or the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System. And again, you know, just to recap from the webinar last time, MIPS is based on four areas of care, and those areas of care are quality, <coughs> cost, improvement activities and advancing care information. So probably most of you all have something that you're doing under quality for the FLEX grant. Um, and of course, hospital quality metrics can be a little bit different than the physician quality metrics, but there's definitely some overlap here in some of those metrics. Um, cost containment, again, this is a little tricky for our critical access hospitals, um, but definitely things you can do operationally under the SHIP grant, too, to help this improvement activities. That's a little easier and overlaps with some areas around um, innovative care models and population health management. And then advancing care information is your EHR, um, your EHR category. And so for anybody who wants a review on this, there's a really great one-page fact sheet that's available through CMS here. 
Um, so one of the first things that all of your hospitals should be aware of is are they or aren't they subject to MIPS? Like Lisa was saying, um, if you had hospitals that reported that they did not report in the survey, um, it's worth revisiting with your hospitals just to make sure if they know they are um, subject to MIPS or not. Supposedly, CMS sends out eligibility um, letters to all of the folks saying you're eligible, you're not eligible. But what we saw in the practices that we collaborate with is that sometimes CMS got it wrong, sometimes they sent the letter to the wrong person. So if you send out a newsletter, I think it's certainly with um, it's certainly worth checking out. Um, you know, or putting a little blurb in your newsletter is saying, hey, check and see if you're subject to MIPS. If you go to this little link right here um, in blue where it says participation lookup, you can actually um, enter a given practitioner or um, billing group NPI number and see if they're subject to MIPS or not. If you publish this in your newsletter, folks will at least be able to say, Am I subject to MIPS or not? Um, I know when I was the flex coordinator in Oregon, I started the first year that PQRS was um, including rural hospitals, and a lot of our rural hospitals got burned on that because nobody told them they were supposed to be participating. Big challenge. So if you do nothing else um, to provide technical assistance for value-based pay, I know a lot of you said that the Quinn's QIOs are covering this area. I think. As um, you know, the flex coordinator, you kind of have a special way to get attention. So if you do nothing else, um, make sure your hospitals know whether or not they're subject to MIPS. Um, if you have hospitals that are struggling with MIPS, there's a lot of areas for technical assistance. A lot of you mentioned your Quinn's QIOs. They also have special programs for small rural underserved practices. And if you have a hospital who needs more technical assistance on the care delivery side of things to contain their costs or improve their quality, I would recommend taking a look at the Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative. It's a little bit more comprehensive than the small and rural underserved practice um, TA. The top option here is the SERS program is more kind of like, um, it's more like policy technical assistance or regulatory technical assistance. TCPI is more about quality improvements and care delivery reform. And then there's a bunch of training videos. If you're not feeling as familiar as you'd like to be with the quality payment program, which is the overall umbrella program for value-based pay. There's some great training videos that are available. Um, if you haven't checked out the QPP page, I would recommend checking it out. For a CMS page, it's actually very friendly, and they put a ton of resources up there. So that's another good resource to have. Um, so I think once you've kind of taken care of your hospitals in that domain of do they report, do they not need to report, the section, the second option is to make sure that they know what are their alternative payment options. Um, so as we talked about last time, basically ACOs, because of the nature of critical access hospital reimbursement, are pretty much the only option. So we're going to spend or spend a little bit more time talking about what those options um, or what ACOs look like in particular. But there's a full list of um, options available on the QPP website in case you have a hospital that undergoes a conversion or something like that. So one of the big things that you can do under the structural area is help facilitate these discussions at a state level. So I'm hoping that um, with that summary you prepared, it's at least a starting point for initiating that discussion with your hospitals. I mean, um, Missouri, Mississippi, I think you're lucky in that your hospital associations have nudged that discussion along. But I think it's certainly worth it if you're not in one of those states where another association has already initiated the discussion to send out those talking points and those findings that you got from the survey. Um, maybe, Shannon, we can talk to Caleb about um, reopening the survey and let, or letting people send the link out again and resending the results. Or maybe you all want to make your own survey. But I think it's worth kind of nudging the discussion along using those survey results. Um, if anybody wants to talk to a FLEX program that's done a great job of facilitating the discussion and really making a clear path to value-based pay for their rural hospitals, I would definitely recommend talking with John Barnes or Crystal Barter up at the Michigan Center for Rural Health. Um, they've got, I think, over half of their rural hospitals in an ACO together now, which has allowed the rural hospitals to kind of band together and free up some shared savings to work on population health. 
So you're, we're definitely seeing a state, a examples of state-level entities. I know uh, we had Jackson Montana Hospital Association on before, um, but definitely seeing some good examples of state entities convening discussions for, uh, for the rural hospital. So it's worth using those survey results to at least start the discussion. Um, so as far as what that looks like, you know, one of the big things is that you have to have at least 5,000 patients in an ACO. One thing to keep in mind is that with 5,000 patients, some of the metrics in the ACO are smaller, um, are smaller metrics, like, you know, not every patient in your ACO is going to have a heart attack, things like that. So if you can build that load up above 5,000 patients, meaning you might have to have, you know, 10, 15, 20 communities working together to get a really good stable number where you can have predictable outcomes in population health, that's definitely something to keep in mind. So somebody who can kind of help convene hospitals, um, you know, ACOs can cross state lines, they can cross organizational lines. So there's a lot of different ways to look for partners here in the ACO, but helping facilitate and start that discussion about how are we going to partner together is a major role that you all can play. And like I said, there's a lot of different partners that you can involve in this. And ACO, the way Medicare defines it in your CMS application is that you get to pick which tax IDs are associated into your ACO, and you can design your ACO corporation, so to speak, with um, several different stipulations. You can have a for-profit ACO. You can have a non-profit ACO. You can kind of make your own organization and make your own governance. So that's something to educate your hospitals around, too. It's a pretty complicated legal area, but I think the biggest thing to take away is that there's flexibility there. Um, you know, as long as you've got those 5,000 Medicare patients or who are part of entities that are willing to participate for three years, you can consider a lot of different options. Um, in some cases, it's an independent provider organization that initiates the ACO. In some cases, it's an already standing network. Um, it really just depends kind of how you want to structure it. But because it is that separate legal entity, you've got some flexibility there. Um, and one of the other really key things is that um, federally qualified health centers and rural health clinics are two really important sources of primary care that have been barred from other primary care alternative payment programs, such as CPC+. So a lot of times you'll have FQHCs and rural health clinics who are really interested in partnering together with critical access hospitals for an ACO because that's the only way the RHCs and the FQHCs can get into value-based pay. So there's a lot of reasons to look for synergy here and definitely some paths to pursue. But these are just the basics of kind of forming an ACO. Does anybody have any questions about this before we shift gears slightly? No? All right. We'll go ahead and shift to talking a little bit about more the competency areas. Um, so once you've got your legal structure for the ACO sorted out and kind of you've been able to start that discussion, what you need to be successful in a value-based pay model, whether it's MIPS, whether it's an ACO, whether it's CPC+, Plus, doesn't matter what the alternative payment model is. There's a couple elements that you need in order to be successful. I think one of the biggest challenges and one of the big reasons that we hear that ACOs are not having the results that people expected was I talked to a lot of people who were in an ACO, but all they did was fill out the application. They didn't change the way they were delivering care. They didn't change the way they communicated with their patients. And so, you know, it's almost kind of common sense what you would expect. If you don't change anything, you're going to get the same results. And because the principle of being in an ACO is that you're benchmarked against yourself, you've got to beat yourself um, with shared savings or with savings of 3% threshold, usually if you don't change what you're doing, you're going to see the exact same results. So one of the competencies that you really want to get practices to further develop is um, care transformation, looking at their data to improve. And that usually spans across three domains. So if you're doing care coordination and you're taking care of prevention and you've got accurate population data, you're in a better place than at least 50% of alternative payment participants out there. But you've got to be doing these three things and you've got to be doing them together. 
Um, as far as care coordination goes, I think this is one of the areas that's received a lot of attention lately. Um, and it does wonderful things for a lot of patients who really need extra assistance, but care coordination alone is not going to make you successful in an ACO. You really need to have this prevention piece, too, so that you can prevent those falls, prevent flu, prevent pneumonia, and you've got to have a pretty decent population size to be able to see the public health effects of a lot of these prevention efforts. Um, also, accurate population data. Going back to the HCC scores, if you didn't have a chance to look at that data file, I know it was kind of a beast, but I think it's really worth taking a look at so you can get a good feel for how your population is being portrayed because that is how your, um, your benchmark is calculated. It factors in the risk of your population. Um, so these are kind of the core elements that you want to be looking at. And again, I think there's ways to do this across some of the FLEX program areas, but I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about, um, as we've just started to talk about care coordination and population health management quality, I'm curious if anybody is, um, I'm curious if anybody has directly addressed any of these areas already in their FLEX funding. Is anybody working on these and wants to share with the group? No. Well, I guess um, we'll go through kind of area by area, and I'll ask a little bit what y'all are doing. Um, I know everybody just submitted their new funding proposals, but in the past, if you've done anything that addressed any of these areas, or maybe you want to share what you're doing in some of these areas, and we can think of a way to um, redirect some of it to prep for value-based pay. I think, um, I know one of the things that I dealt with when I was a flex coordinator in Oregon was we kind of had a schism between our hospitals that were really advanced and our hospitals that were barely surviving. And so um, it, it was hard to kind of have a discussion with everybody together. We had to tailor a lot. For those really advanced hospitals, it was also hard to find a way way to maintain engagement and help them and keep them involved in the state rural health scene, so to speak. So I think for those hospitals that feel like they are, um, th those hospitals that feel like they are really um, kind of killing it and they're ready for value-based pay, this is a way to kind of teach the top of the class as well. So I think this is an exciting thing that you can offer to get more engagement in your flex program as a whole. All right, Dave. so let's talk, oh, yeah. Hi, Maeve, this is Mary Sheridan and Stephanie Saig. Um, we just wanted to comment back to your earlier question about any potential alignment with FLEX. Um, we had put in a technical assistance request to TASC around population health um, as part of our FLEX grant, and we just had a call yesterday that they facilitated with Stratus. Um, and, mm -hmm. and they really gave us some ideas that we're going to move forward with in FLEX that we really felt was well aligned with at least a starting point with population health and, um, and this collaborative. So, so there may be some opportunities even to maybe get some feedback and some alignment um, in your FLEX grant, maybe in, in ways that you hadn't really thought about. That's really exciting. Do you, um, are you able to share any of the specific examples or suggestions that Stratus was able to give you? Yes. Well, they actually gave us an example about uh, uh, maybe thinking about conducting monthly office hours, and they actually provided Georgia as a really great example of what they are doing. But we felt at this point we're not really ready to tackle that because we don't really have that expertise yet. So um, in talking with them, we decided what we're going to do is start with doing a community health needs assessment inventory because we don't really have a great handle on the, the universe of CAHs and do they have a CHNA or not. Um, and then potentially connecting mm -hmm. that to offering a population health subgrant opportunity in the coming year and um, connecting that with the, um, there is kind of a self readiness assessment around population health management on the um, Rural Health Resource Center website. So we're going to try to link it there. So we're still thinking about it, but there's a really nice readiness tool that they have that I think would be valuable for CAHs. 
that's a great suggestion. And I think I love your point about the readiness assessment because what I find in talking to folks across the country is that population health management has so many different definitions. So it's really helpful to do one of those readiness assessments because, you know, you might be doing 50% of things for population health, but when you do the readiness assessment, it gives you some other ideas to kind of bounce um, to bounce off your clinics and your hospitals to see what's going on there. So I think those are that's great insight. And you said that Georgia was the example state that they referenced? Um, yes. Georgia. Yes. Okay, wonderful. All right, Lisa. Nice work in Georgia. <laughs> that's exciting. Yeah, so um, this is Lisa from Georgia. And um, we did work with the National Resource Center on population health for the last two years. And um, that was written specifically. We had never done population health work here in Georgia, so it was our first kind of jump off into it. So we ended up with two separate cohorts, and one was doing what you were uh, describing as far as the deeper dive into the CHNA, and then we took the group that was in year one that wanted to go deeper, and they're the ones that are getting the, the office hours and the consultative services that are more directed on operations and how to make it happen. And um, we, as far as our FLEX program this year, um, we've had to take a little bit of retooling in this expansion, you know, this extension year. But we do plan on our uh, competitive grant to actually write in a more engagement of provider-based physicians uh, with our critical access hospitals because, as maybe you have talked about, they were surprised by PQRS. We still don't know what they know about MIPS, even though we're, we're hitting it from a lot of different angles. It's not, a, it's, it's not a coordinated effort, so I think there's lots of opportunity. And the data that you provided to help us look at the communities uh, was data I had never had access to, so I'm very excited about what you sent us this week. Well, good. I'm glad it was helpful. And, you know, it's, this is one of, the, I think, the challenging things about CMS is they do put that data out there, but it is sure hard to find it. So that definitely took me a while of um, Googling for that data set. But, yeah, I think it's a good starting point for discussion. And I find that people are always, like, if you can show them their data about, you know, their county or their hospital, they're always more interested. So I'm excited to hear that you're going to be getting into that with them. Well, and it really does make the case for the business case for us to look at incremental improvement on preventive services and annual wellness visits and coordinated care, how much of doing the right thing actually is the right thing financially as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's a big shift that we've seen recently too. I mean, as of, you know, I, well, even three years ago, a lot of those codes around chronic care management, around um, you know, annual wellness visits, things like that, were not nearly as robust. So, you know, really there there wasn't a business case, but now we're lucky that there really is. And we'll talk about that in a minute in terms of some of the things, like a lot of folks are providing chronic care management right now but not billing for it. So there's a lot of opportunities there, I think, to um, build the financial health of um, the healthcare facilities as well. Um, so I want to go through and talk about some alignment between areas of technical assistance in terms of quality. And I know quality and flex has traditionally really focused on, you know, the MD quit measures with good reason. Obviously, we want good rural health data out there and assistance around improving those metrics. Um, but I'm wondering, and of course, like I said, I haven't seen the competitive funding announcement, if there's any opportunity there. I'll pull up what the ACO metrics are, where y'all are seeing any kind of alignment between what you can do in, with your MD equipment measures and what you can do to support some of those ACO measures. Because I think, um, if I'm not wrong, some of the, like, flu vaccine, pneumonia vaccine, I feel like these are things that come up in MD equip, um, but there might be some synergy here between um, the measures that you can use to um, not only support your MD equipment measures, but also support what's going on in people's ACO programs as well. Um, and I think one of the big things here too is that you know there's definitely um, there's definitely a good body of these metrics that are outpatient focused because the ACO program is really designed to be focused on prevention. But there's also opportunities for synergy with the inpatient side of things. Um, so you can kind of see what the metrics are. And I think overall training on, um, you know, communication, 
patient engagement, access to care. These are things that kind of cross the boundary between outpatient and inpatient care. Um, and then, of course, readmissions and admissions, a um, little different there, but absolutely need hospital buy-in to do well in the ACO and that. So this is just a snapshot of ACO metrics. They're all publicly available. Um, but be thinking, too, as you're kind of tailoring your MDQIP assistance, are there any ways that we can tailor some of these to our ACO folks as well? All right. It sounds like George is doing some work with the diabetes prevention program. That's wonderful. And I think that's one of the um, one of the things that under population health you can really do to help bolster community capacity and at the same time generate some revenue. Um, so going back to I think it was Lisa's point around, you know, there's a business case for value-based pay, even if you don't have hospitals who are willing to jump in um, and go full whole hog on a risk-bearing ACO, just educating them around preparation on the business side of things for um, what they need to do to prepare for value-based pay can be really helpful. So if you have um, financial and operational dollars that are laying around, I think some of the areas that I would recommend looking at are taking a look at your HCC coding, and we'll talk in depth about what that is in just a second here. Um, looking at your billable care coordination opportunities, help them do some business modeling around that maybe. One of the things that um, I found out, I was working with the state of Oregon because I was back there for a conference the other week, and um, I found out that a lot of our rural health clinics aren't billing for um, are billing for chronic care management. And chronic care management, you can now bill $60 per patient per month. Um, so I found out that there was over half a million dollars of revenue just kind of sitting on the table in Eastern Oregon, um, which would be a huge boost to the communities there. Um, so training around ACO development, again, you know, like I mentioned, it can be kind of a complex legal arrangement, but there's potential there. I know we used to do board training as part of our FLEX grant, but being able to um, Take a look at kind of forming networks, collaborating, things like that. Probably be a good use of those dollars. Um, helping them model the impact of myths. Um, again, you can be subject to up to a negative 9% adjustment on your Part B payments if you're not participating in myths. Um, on the positive side, you can get a positive 9% uh, adjustment, but it's unlikely that we're all going to get that just because of the way the numbers work with smaller sample sizes. And then I think business planning, too for an alternative payment model is also really important. And with financial and operational, you have the opportunity to touch all of these domains around getting accurate population data, care coordination, and prevention as well. Um, I want to spend a couple minutes talking about risk adjustment, just because this is something that rural is universally not doing well, but really needs to do better if they want a path to do well in any kind of value-based pay. I mean, with value-based pay, you could be running the best care coordination program in the world, and you could be running the best prevention program in the world, but if CMS is looking at your population data and saying, well, it doesn't matter that, you know, in this county or this hospital, they're doing really good prevention care coordination because their patients aren't sick anyways, we expect the patients to have, you know, zero spend in Medicare, they're going to get burned if they try to go for any kind of shared savings or MIPS payment, things like that. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about risk adjustment is, and I think if you do nothing um, but focus on risk adjustment, you'll be taking a significant step towards helping hospitals go into value-based pay in a positive way with their MIPS uh, payments. So what is risk adjustment in CMS's eyes? Basically, traditionally, Medicare only used risk adjustment for their MedAdvantage plans. The idea was that if they used risk adjustment with the MedAdvantage plans, MedAdvantage plans wouldn't be able to cherry pick healthy beneficiaries and reap a lot of profit. So they started doing what are called these HCC codes so that they could say, gosh, we've got a diabetic with such and such complications, things like that, they're higher risk versus we've got a healthy 65-year-old who plays tennis every day. They've got very little risk complications. So risk adjustment is a number that's assigned to a beneficiary to project how much money they'll take thought they'll take up or project their utilization on the healthcare system. So risk adjustment is now applied to any kind of um, value-based 
cost pay model. So it's subject or it affects beneficiaries in the quality payment and MIPS program too now, as well as ACOs and CPC plus. Um, so there's kind of two pieces that CMS looks at to get the risk adjustment factor. And this all comes from people's Medicare enrollment information and claims. Um, and so that's really important. What you have in the EHR doesn't matter for risk adjustment in CMS's um, eyes. It's just the data that Medicare has through their claims and enrollment. So hierarchical condition codes, or HCC codes, um, are the codes that CMS uses to assess the um, to assess the physical health of the patient. Um, so there's a couple things you want to know about this. Um, basically, the codes are based on the diagnoses from inpatient and outpatient hospital and physician data. So it has to be on the claims um, in order for CMS to take information into account. That's why it's really important to have good efficiency between your EHR. Um, note taking and also your coding and billing piece of things. Um, this is prospectively assigned, so CMS forgets each year that a patient had any kind of sickness. Every patient starts out more or less with a score of one, um, but for example, if you have an amputation that makes you a high risk patient, things like that. However, if you were seen in, you know, 2017, but you don't come back in 2018, Matt Logically, um, a year after your last appointment, you bump up to being a healthier patient. So it's really important to see patients each year to keep their risks accurate. Um, and there's also kind of a, um, a compounding factor here with HCC codes. Um, it's important to include multiple diagnoses on the claims because disease interactions can amplify the level of risk. So if you have a physician who, you know, if you have a diabetic CHF patient who comes in for a sore throat, if the only thing that the physician puts on the claim is tonsillitis, they're missing out on a lot of reimbursement because they didn't take into account the other um, health conditions that that patient is dealing with. And then another factor here, and this isn't as big of a factor usually, is just the age, gender, and Medicare entitlement status. And these are the four things that affect the HCC codes. Um, so the idea is that risk adjustment is supposed to benefit your clinicians. Um, it's supposed to make it so that physicians and advanced practice providers who treat sicker patients get more resources to do so. And it's meant so that, you know, hospitals who take on higher risk patients have that accounted for when their shared savings are calculated. Risk adjustment is your friend if you use it correctly. Um, so the idea is that there's all kinds of hierarchical categories that feed into this, um, looking at all of the different kind of diagnostic categories as well as disease interactions and disability stats can feed into this. So the idea is that this is really focused on whole patient care. You don't ever only want to only address, um, you know, the sore throat or only address, um, you know, the broken arm. This is about looking at, you know, your patient's health as a whole and say, well, is their diabetes going to affect how hard they can exercise when they're recovering from their hip surgery, things like that. So this is a pretty complicated area, but it's important to really emphasize with providers that, um, you know, it's not just about the one thing you're treating at that point in time. Uh, this is an area that you want to go back and look at kind of that population health and whole patient health list. So, uh, one of the things that plays in here is risk adjustment factor as well. And so this is what is used to, um, this is what is used to do the final adjustment on that payment. And this equals the HCC code plus the real, or the reason for entitlement. And reason for entitlement is just a fancy way to say, why is this patient on Medicare? Is it because of, disability, or is it because they aged into the program, things like that. So the simple way to look at this is that the risk adjustment factor, which is going to adjust payments under the physician fee schedule, um, is based on the age, sex, and the original reason for entitlement plus the HCC codes. So you've got the disease codes plus just kind of the demographic codes equals your risk adjustment factor. So the data that you have is looking at the HCC codes. And this is the data that hospitals are responsible for putting on the claim and physicians in the outpatient setting are responsible for putting on the claim um, so that 
physicians can get this data over to Medicare. Medicare already has this data around age, sex, and original reason for entitlement. So what you want to do the training on with your, um, with your hospitals and clinicians are HCC codes. All right. Um, so basically, when you're looking at things, um, when you're looking at your HCC scores, there's kind of two ways you can take this. Um, one, if you have a low HCC score, a low risk adjustment factor, it could mean that you have a healthier population. You know, maybe you are a critical access hospital in Vail, Colorado, and you've got, like, a bunch of wealthy younger retirees there, and that's fine. You're doing coding right. It can also indicate that you have inadequate chart documentation or incomplete coding or that your patient just hasn't been seen in a long time. So as far as um, how these risk adjustment factors are used, they're used to set the benchmark for how much money your patient should cost in an ACO. Um, if you have folks who are participating in CPC+, Plus, it's going to determine the care management fee that you get. Um, and under MIPS, it's going to adjust your payment. Um, if your critical access hospitals are supporting really sick patients, they're going to get special payments to further support that. Um, so risk coding is basically important to anybody now. You know, previously it only mattered for those Medicare Advantage patients, but now it matters in the ACO, it matters in this, it matters in the other alternative payment models. So it's really important to make sure that especially in rural health where we're often taking care of sicker patients, that everybody is getting the, um, the care they need. Um, so the bottom line is you've got to be doing training on risk. I think this is a really easy one. Um, there's a lot of folks who will do training on HCC coding. Um, you know, this is another example of technical assistance that's available through um, the TCTI program that's completely free of charge, but you can also pay vendors to do it as well. Um, the other piece of the business case that you want to make sure your hospitals are aware of is that um, for those with provider-based clinics, a lot of these codes that relate to population health are billable. This is just an example of average national Medicare payments for those who have provider-based clinics of what you can get. CCM is upwards of $42 a month. Behavioral care management, upwards of $48. Psychiatric collaborative care management, $128. Um, there's a lot of good options here to provide more of those population health type services. And I think um, Lisa mentioned, too, that she's looking at the Diabetes Prevention Program. Um, and that's another program that's now billable, too, as well. Um, so we're running a little short on time, so we'll skip the discussion question. Um, but in terms of population health, I think this is another area where you can be really creative with how your flex dollars are used. Um, like I said, you know, one of the big reasons that we're seeing people drop out of alternative payment models is they enter the alternative payment model and they don't change a thing in how they're managing population health. Um, so unless you change your care delivery, you're likely not going to see any benefits to an alternative payment model other than exemptions from reporting in some areas. Um, so I think population health management is a great training tool under the FLEX program to be able to get folks um, involved in chronic care management or to be able to get them thinking about how do I actually use data for improvement in my population. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do here. I think I'm um, looking at transitions of care. We saw in the ACO quality metric that readmissions and admissions to start with are metrics that you're judged on. So transitions in care are really important. Um, data gathering on population health, that's another huge thing. Most successful ACOs have some kind of data management software um, or some kind of, you know, reporting system within their EHR to be able to look and get insight on that. So I think that's another important thing that you can look at with population health. Even strategic planning for population health, helping practices take a look at their population needs and look at, you know, do we want to introduce the diabetes prevention program or do we need to implement, you know, psychiatric collaborative care management, things like that. And then helping them look at strategically how are they going to fund this, what kind of staffing they're going to need. I think teaching people to staff strategically for population health is a huge thing that you can be helpful with. And then developing networks and helping folks connect based on what their HCC scores are, how close they are, do they refer to the same hospitals. You can definitely do a lot here to be able to help folks connect. Um, there's a lot of different data sources out there. And I think one of the things that 
um, you can do to help hospitals is look at their CMS data, look at their quality and resource use reports. That's kind of your um, the quality and resource use reports. I don't know if any of y'all have gone over that with your hospitals, but they're really interesting reports because they'll reflect what you all are getting on. Um, They'll reflect what hospitals are getting as far as CMS's perception of those risk scores. So if you have a hospital who pulls their quality resource use report, sometimes for critical access hospitals and RHCs, they can look kind of funny because of the cost-based reimbursement. But you can at least get a good picture of are those clinics and hospitals doing enough coding to capture risk on their claims. Um, county health rankings, I think, are another great area to look at your population health. And then they, we also have alternative payment model databases where you can look at, you know, how prevalent are ACOs in my area, who are the players in these ACOs, things like that. And that can help kind of inform the state climate as well. Um, so we're almost at the end of time as far as um, kind of what the interventions are. Again, this is meant to be really general today, and next time we're going to dig a little deeper into what are some of the specific interventions and next steps you want to look at. Um, so at this point in Learning Collaborative, you should have filled out um, your template state assessment for value-based pay. Again, you can use that however you like. Hopefully it helps in some way to start the discussion, and if not with your hospitals, maybe with your hospital association, your primary care association, just to give a um, just to give a better idea of what's going on. Um, and I know that, um, oh, we've got a couple things going into the chat box. So I'm going to read those before folks have to hop off. Um, all right, so it sounds like there's a couple other resources for education on um, HCC scores. And actually, um, one of my employees used to work at the Regional Extension Center and University of Kentucky, and they do have some really good, um, they do have some really good um, trainings on that. I think one of the things there that's really helpful is, you know, if somebody else is doing it, don't bother making your own training. But if you can partner with them to present a webinar just to make sure that folks who maybe aren't in touch with the REC but are in touch with you get that education, I think that's a great suggestion, Kayla. Um, and then Mary asked, um, how can we access the APM database? This PowerPoint has links in it um, that aren't coming through. So I will go ahead and um, repost that link to Moodle and include it in the follow-up email. Um, the other thing that you'll get are, um, or the other thing that you'll get between now and next week is just the state resource guide for value-based pay. And this will help you map up kind of the Kayla's point you know, based on the domains that we've talked about, where can people get that assistance, either through you or through the QIO? And it will help give you a better picture of, you know, as a flex program, where should you strategically focus? You know, maybe folks have um, great trainings that they're already doing on coding. So that frees you up to only focus on population health, things like that. But this will be something that you can hand to the hospitals in your state to be able to say, hey, if you're thinking of getting ready for value-based pay, Here's some resources and kind of a checklist that you want to look at. Um, so this will be another tool in your toolbox by the time you're done with this collaborative that you'll be able to, to use with folks. So that's kind of our next step. You'll get instructions on that via email probably tomorrow morning. Um, this is all I have for you all today. So I'll pause here and take some questions if there are any. And if not, um, we'll see you at the same time next week.